Big Fluff. The ball must be held at all times. Player gear may be only used to dislodge the ball or prevent a score. A team gaining possession must first do the rabbit hole. That's that killer tunnel above each bench. Then make one circuit through enemy territory, and then they are eligible to score. All you really have to know is there's only one way to score. And that's when a player takes one of the balls, wings it, and one of the iron goals hard enough to set off the pyro. As for the rest of the rules, well, the rest of the rules are Russian and complicated, and we have lots of... What's it gonna be, Uchao? Us or them? Us or them, huh? Hey, it's Outlander. The guards are yet ready. We got some big goons over there, people. Watch your backsides. Ten seconds, the first ball. First ball wagers close in ten seconds. Five, four, three. It's us! Balls away, it's... Oh, hey everybody, I'm Joel Murphy. And I'm Andy McIntyre. And this is Silver Linings Playback, the podcast where we watch maligned movies and we find their silver linings. And we are uh, continuing career killer month Doing rollerball. 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 Yeah, we are. And this one, uh, this this movie has a bit of a body count on it. Yeah, Chris Klein being, I think, the person whose career was harmed the most by it. Well, career, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so you have Chris Klein, who this is sort of when he was still had leading man potential. And I think that you could see that phase out after this film uh but you also have not really this movie's fault but worth mentioning that while paul Heyman was making it ecw was dying that's true yeah um and a lot of people uh took umbrage with the fact that he was filming rollerball while ecw was dying yeah looked at it a little bit of like fleeing the sinking ship to go do what some might call a cash grab <laughs> as the announcer in rollerball and then I think the other one we have to talk about is a legendary director who has actually come up on this show before uh, in uh, in McTiernan, who only directed one movie after this. So I definitely think this led towards killing his career, but also went to prison because of this movie. That's right. He did go to prison uh, for money laundering. No, 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 no. Uh, He went to prison because he had a dispute with one of the producers who made this film. This was eight years after it came out. All this came out in court. He used a private detective who did an illegal wiretap on the producer that he he basically was disputing with a guy over money or something like that. Hired a private detective. The private detective wiretapped a producer's phone and McTiernan lied about it uh to authorities and did a year in federal prison for uh lying about it as one does yeah so i think that's a first on silver linings playback the first time someone's gone to like a movie went so badly that someone went to prison over it and you could argue that someone should have gone to prison for garfield the tale of two kitties but here we are i've said it before they should all be tried at the hague but yeah, it, it's uh, it, it's pretty horrific. But yeah, John McTiernan, uh, one of the most acclaimed action movie directors of all time. He made, in my opinion, the greatest action movie of all time in Die Hard. And like definitely an unimpeachably great movie, along with a bunch of other bangers. Like, I think his resume is solid, like, but yet he's come up twice on this podcast. Yeah, had he just done Die Hard, that would have been enough. Yeah. But yeah, McTiernan like, had an amazing career. He's, a, he's one of the great action directors. And I don't know what happened here. Uh, this is also... Oh, you could argue that he did the two best action movies of all time, Predator and Die Hard. Right, yeah, he also did Predator. Yeah, which again is just 
amazing. Like, no, the the dude is a great director. Uh, he also weirdly, I, I I'm just throwing this out there. The uh, the late great Norman Jewison, who we lost this year. Uh, this is the second film of his that he remade along with the Thomas Crown Affair. Uh, if you don't know Norman Jewison, he also did um, Moonlight or Moonstruck and uh, Fiddler on the Roof. Yeah, um, I don't know. Just because it's pretty short, John McTiernan's filmography. Nomads, which I'm not familiar with. That's a movie uh, with the, the lady that drove around in the van and worked at Amazon. Oh, uh, right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but then he did Predator, mm-hmm. Die Hard, The Hunt for Red October, Medicine Man, Last Action Hero, Die Hard with a Vengeance, Thomas Crown Affair, 13th Warrior, Rollerball, and Basic. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's pretty awesome. I mean, Medicine Man, pow. Yeah. Zing. The one of the greatest action movies I've ever seen, Medicine Man. When he grinds up that medicine and, uh, you know, is threatened. I did. I have seen that movie. I have the vaguest memories of it, but I have. Seen I medicine watched Man. it, I think, like after the AP exam and AP bio class in high school. You know, I'm almost positive we watched it in school, too. That must have been one of them approved. Like, this is educational somehow. <laughs> It's about ecology and the rainforest. Yeah. And it's Edie Falco and uh, Sean Connery. Yeah. Oh, oh, we're talking about roller medicine. <laughs> the cure for the plague of the 20th century. <laughs> Only the penitent man will pass. Penitent man. Penitent man. Penitent man. Penitent man. Penitent man. Penitent. <laughs> the medicine man will pass. The yeah. medicine. The medicine. <laughs> Medicine Man will pass. So we all remember it, obviously. Yeah, the famous line from that. <laughs> um, but no, we're talking about Rollerball, which is a remake of the 1975 Rollerball movie. Starring James Caan. Oh, no, James Caan, that's right. Yeah, which I've never seen, but I now want to. But yeah, because... I do want to after yeah. watching this, but I've not seen the... Um, yeah. But yeah, this is a movie about um, Quidditch, basically. Yeah, I think we probably have to spend some time talking about rollerball as a sport as we <laughs> discuss this movie. Because it, it's loosely based on roller derby. Right. Which roller derby, legit sport, you know. Yeah, the rules are a little convoluted, but what sport isn't when you really take a step back and zoom out? Right. But yeah, this somehow takes roller derby, makes it more complicated in like the scoring and the these giant ramps and stuff. And adds people on motorcycles and makes For some way reason. less sense. And people dress like Mortal Kombat characters. Yeah, that definitely seems to be a part of it. Um, and there's only two teams. One team is red the whole time. The other team just changes colors. That is legit. You probably read the same thing I did that. Uh, that was a, a decision that John McTiernan made was just to use the same group of actors over and over again as every other team and just dress them differently. Yeah, because and it's funny because Andrew Brynjarski, who I love, I'm a big fan of, is very distinct. Yeah. And I, I'm not sure if he's the same character because they talk about a bunch of teams trading people to the gold team for the finals. Um, but it might not be. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I also don't think it matters one way or the other. <laughs> that they it does that. not. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so there's a sport called rollerball that makes no sense. You heard Paul Heyman explaining it. That is, by the way, all the explanation that we get in the movie. That's that's it. You get that at the beginning and then it's like, OK, we understand rollerball. And then. At the end, they they there's a whole entire the plot revolves around the idea that all the rules are thrown out. And I was like, but you've never established what any rules are. <laughs> and just the dejection on Paul Heyman's face. He's like, well, I can't do this. Yeah. <laughs> I look, I mean, we're going to have a lot to say about Paul Heyman when. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll hold off on it. But. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, this uh, this movie also stars Chris Klein, as we mentioned. People whose cr- careers were not killed by this movie. LL Cool J. Yep. That's because ladies Rebecca, love him. Ladies love him. You know, they, it would have hurt his career, but the ladies love him too much. 
Cool James. Um, ladies love Cool James Todd Smith. <laughs> uh, Rebecca Romaine Stamos O'Connell. Mm-hmm. I think she might have just been Rebecca Romaine at this point. No, she had a Stamos in the credits. Did she have a Stamos in the credits? Yeah. Well, there you go. Um, Which I... I read uh, on the IMDb trivia that she had two caveats for doing this movie. She didn't want to do the nude scene, and she wanted a scar. And those are my writers, too, so I totally get it. That's what yeah. I requested. Even though she did the nude scene. I don't think it was her. I think it was a body double. Okay. Yeah. But wasn't her face in the shot? I don't, I don't remember. I don't know. I didn't care enough. But that's yeah, what I, I read either. on IMDb. But she did have the scar. Yeah. Maybe she maybe they compromised. It's like, all right, we'll give you the scar, but you'd still have to do the nude scene. Um, it also has friend of the show, Jean Renault. Yeah, it does. And Naveen Andrews, who I thought was going to be a bigger thing. I'm just going to put that out there. Wasn't he? Was he in Lost? I'm he was to... in Lost. Yeah. Yeah. And he was in um, Planet Terror, part of the Grindhouse double feature gimmick. That's right. Yeah. I don't know. I thought that there was like a character, like he had just a character actor vibe that I thought it could have been a bigger deal i thought he was good he in was. this yeah I, yeah i think he's good in most things yeah and then um a bunch of mma fighters and stunt people and that's the cast yeah and so basically it takes place <laughs> it, it's funny because it's in a near future, but only three years in the future, which was yeah, the movie funny. came out in 02. It's set in the distant future of 2005. I like that swing to be like, we're only three years out from this. But yeah, it's basically that it, uh, it seems to be a Russian based uh, sport that has an international audience and tours around a little bit in uh in the east but yeah there's teams in kazakhstan a lot of the former soviet republics azerbaijan and kazakhstan are i think the two that get name checked yeah and uh oh also when you were mentioning people that are in the movie you didn't mention slipknot because they're not in the movie well they're in the movie but apparently they just shot their concert and then superimposed the and crop. then just super cut it in yeah yeah pink is in the movie mm-hmm that's true. For, yeah. for, and Shane McMahon, who we already mentioned. Yeah. I know we, we didn't mention on air. We were talking about him before we, we before started recording. Yep. But yes, uh, golden boy Shane McMahon. Who was in this as long as he was in the ring for WrestleMania 39. Yep. Accurate. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, the, it's this sport. It's, it's got this big audience. It's violent. And the, a lot of it centered on gambling. A lot of it centered on gambling, like all sports are, let's be honest. But uh, yeah, Jean Renault runs it. And it seems like as much as I understood what we were going for with this plot, that I think he just starts orchestrating attacks of people on purpose to juice the ratings. Yeah, he's, he starts working it, basically. Yeah, that there's there's a whole thing where one of the guys on Chris Klein's team is attacked. And then Rebecca Romaine figures out that the cameras were on the guy before he was attacked, implying that they knew it was going to happen. And, yeah, so it and, turns out that rollerball, much like the NFL, is worked. Yeah, and they call it sports entertainment as well. <laughs> uh, and they cast Paul Heyman and put Shane McMahon in it. So clearly they're, you know... Uh, they know, they did, <laughs> McTiernan did his research. Yes. And and so that sets off like Chris Klein uh, tries to take on the machine and uh, has a night vision fight where he tries to escape and fails to escape. And so then he they try to murder him in a rollerball match and then he murders them. Yep. And everyone rollerballs and they they all rollerball the hell out of it. Yeah. This this movie is paced so bizarrely. Yeah. Let's start there. That okay. seems like a place to start. Let's start there. So it starts with uh, Chris Klein, competitive underground street luging. Which we all remember how big that was in 2005. Huge. Yeah. Huge. I thought it was um, going to be an Olympic sport. It, yeah, it should be. I thought finally here's a summer games 
answer to the luge in the winter games. We've done it. Because everyone's favorite winter Olympic sport is the luge. And we've all thought, what if they did that in traffic? Yeah. Like, that's what that mis- that's what that's missing. Moving obstacles that can kill them. Right. And it also has to take place in L.A. on those specific streets that are slanted like that. Yes. Yeah. Um, which is all part of L.A.'s plan to just get the bid for the Olympics every year. Which I'm excited about. I can tell you as someone who lives here, can't wait for those Olympics. Because you know what we need in L.A.? More traffic. Just more people coming and staying for a short time and clogging up the streets is, I think, what they need. Yeah. And also, I, oh, man, that's just that's that's part of the fringe benefits. But also think about it. Think about it. It'll be so expensive to to get anything or rent any place to stay or get around. It's going to be a fun three weeks. It'll, it'll be a dream. Can't wait. I'll, I'll be I'll be paying a visit for sure. That's great. Yeah, you, it'll be easy for you to find a place to stay. I'm sure. Yeah, maybe in Glendale. Nope. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Um. Uh, anyways, uh, but yeah, like, so they have the street luge, and then he gets picked up while street luging by LL Cool J, who's a friend of his, that is driving a fancy car with a lot of bling. Seemingly coincidentally, right? Like, it didn't, it just seemed like he happened to be where LL Cool J was. That didn't seem planned, right? Yeah, and El Cool J implies that he has found a new way to make a lot of money. And then it immediately cuts to the middle of the rollerball season. Yep. Yeah, no no more setup needed. Like, it doesn't, like, roll credits. It doesn't, there's no, like, montage showing him learning the ropes of rollerball. It's just, nope, we're now rolling. We're full rollerballing. And there's some line of dialogue that Paul Heyman has that implies that Chris Klein has been around and is being rebranded as a new character because they say something about him being a Texan or a cowboy or something, which implies that he's been in Rollerball and now is getting a new character. Yes, he's now playing a character closer to himself, the uh, American golden boy hockey star. Right. Jonathan Cross. Yep. The next Wayne Gretzky eschewed the NHL to play rollerball. Yep. Yeah. As one does. Because, yeah, you know, like, why play hockey, a sport that doesn't have violence like rollerball or have putting skates a, like rollerball skates like rollerball or putting a thing in a specified target like rollerball. <laughs> Or motorcycles like rollerball. I guess it was the motorcycles, right? He doesn't even ride one, but I guess he was really into the idea. Or he wanted a team with men and women. And NHL classically sexist as a league. Yep. It's true. Yep. Um, but yeah, and then, you know, they reap the opulence that is the rollerball lifestyle. And then they realize that it's all not on the up and up, which... Why would they care? Because they have integrity? Is that what they're going with? Well, especially LO Cool J, who doesn't care until he cares. And then, like, I never understood the turn. Because at every point up until the end when he's murdered, as he's trying to escape, he can- Murdered with a bazooka. (laughs) He continues to just tell Chris Klein, shut up, don't ask questions, close your eyes, take the money. So it's which implies that he's perfectly aware of everything that's happening. And then eventually he's like, I I shouldn't have told you that this is wrong. Oh, apropos of nothing. And then dies. (laughs) I think the real lesson is you shouldn't have learned a lesson and you'd still be alive. You know who's still alive? Rich. You know who's still alive and rich? Everyone else who plays rollerball. (laughs) Andrew Briniarski. That guy. And he's on like five teams. So he's super rich. He's putting in the work. Um, also along the way, uh, Chris Klein's character, Jonathan Cross, uh, falls in love with his teammate. And that's a thing that happens. Yeah. Yep. But yeah, and then they have the the um, night vision escape scene. Yeah. Yeah. What'd you think of that? It happened. Yeah, it felt like a thing where, because I respect John McTiernan, and I do think he's a good director, I was like, I can see why he wanted to take this on, and what an interesting idea. 
but it's weird that he didn't realize that it didn't work. Yeah, it's 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 a whole bizarre thing. And it it doesn't really make a lot of sense either because like nobody's wearing night vision goggles. It's, there's no reason for there to be night vision. And it feels like something where maybe they could have shot some of it not like that and some of it with night vision and blended it a little bit more. But it it's in night vision for way too long. I mean, and really, this shows just how prescient the movie was because uh, One Night in Paris came out two years later. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, so really, this movie was predicting the future. Yeah, because it's set in 2005 so it does make sense that that would have been all their age right that everyone would be all about the night vision there was i mean i will give it that there was a brief american fascination with night vision that was very short-lived it was like oh At that's a different kind of vision huh it's green and harder to see stuff at night because mm -hmm. everyone was so uh pumped for the virtual boy that Man. you know they want night vision Nintendo's really let us down some bad pathways. You know, their hits are phenomenal. You know, yeah. some of the best selling video game systems of all time. But there's also the Virtual Boy. There's the Virtual Boy. There's what was that? The Power Glove. The Power Glove. It's so bad. That was not good. That was the mat. They had that mat, too, that you were supposed to use. Yeah, the mat that worked for one game. Right. The, I, the Summer Olympics game, oddly enough, to tie it back to the Olympics. Yeah, because my friend had that growing up, the mat. And I, I remember playing it at his house. And it, even for that game, it was like, yeah, OK, this is a thing. It's very neat. Even the Wii, to some extent, I feel the like it was fun. I'm, I will defend the Wii. The Wii was fun for the games that worked. But other times you were like, what is this stick and what am I doing? Yeah, like when you were playing like Zelda or Mar. Well, the Zelda with the actual where you could slash with the swords was kind of fun, but like Mario with the Wii gimmicks was like okay, yeah. But like Wii Sports, hell yeah. The bowling was great. I think the bowling was the marquee game of the Wii. yeah. Bowling was great. Golf was great. Tennis was a ton of fun. Yeah, yeah. Anything that you yeah you needed to swing the thing, but like yeah, I think what they learned. And what I think Xbox and PlayStation already knew is we just want to sit. Just let us sit. I don't want to do stuff. Yeah, I, I just want to play with. I just want to have the controller. I want to be Spider-Man, but I want to be Spider-Man while I'm sitting in a chair watching Spider-Man do the stuff. I want to be the laziest. Sp I want to be the guy in the chair while Spider-Man Spider-Man. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm Genki. <laughs> you know, I'm uh, I'm uh, what's his name? Uh, Ned. You Ned. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't need to be actual Spider-Man. And if I was an actual Spider-Man, I'd be Peter B. Parker, the lazy one. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be uh, Chris, Chris Pine, Peter Parker. That guy dies. That, I know. No, the lesson of this episode is if you care about stuff and you try to fix the system, you die. Unless you're Chris Klein for some reason. Yeah. The lesson is let it happen. <laughs> yeah. Take the money and close your eyes. Um, but back to the night vision chase scene. So they're going 120 miles on a dirt road on a Harley that's not a dirt road bike. No, no consequences. Right. And then they get chased by an airplane. Sure. When there are random boiling sound effects. Yeah, I was <laughs> I meant to pull those and then I didn't get that chance to. Yeah, they are like Wiley e. Coyote boy. Like full on effect. Looney Tunes, like boing. I don't know what they were supposed to be. I don't know either. Yeah. So it was hard to see because it was night vision. Right. Um, and then they almost get to the Azerbaijani border. They I can think see it is. the border. Yeah. Like what? They're yeah, they can see the border. They're looking at it. <laughs> and so then um L Cool J, they fall, and then Chris was like, no, I gotta stay behind L Cool J. You got kids. And then he gets murdered by a bazooka. Well, and well, the, the border patrol doesn't react. Well, and the way they do it is is so shitty, too, because he has to. There's this big jump because, of course, he's got to go up this ramp uh, to make because the bridge is up. So he has to jump from one side of the bridge to the other. And they have the bazooka aimed at him. And Jean Reno is like, no, wait, let's see if he makes it. And then he makes the jump and then they blow him up. 
which is so much crueler. <laughs> it's yeah. Um, I, that whole scene is bananas. And then all of the rollerball scenes are bananas. This whole movie is the well, most 2002 thing that's ever happened. Well, there's a weird moment at, right after that, too. So that happens. And then they capture Chris Klein. And then he has a face to face meeting with Jean Renault, where it's basically like, you can't win. I have all the power in this situation. So then Chris Klein goes, fine. Okay. We want the same thing. I want in. I want profit sharing. I want money. Give me all this stuff. All you have to do is trade Rebecca Romaine to another team and I'll play ball. And I felt like that was supposed to be a misdirect for us. Like we might believe that he's actually changing or at the very least, obviously a misdirect for Jean Renault. But instead, the movie plays it that the second he leaves, Jean Reno's just like, so that's bullshit, right? He's made that up. But fuck him. Let's kill him. And that was like so crazy to me that they didn't even live in that reality that he might do a heel turn for five seconds. Yeah, they, com- they completely no sold it. Yeah, which was just we- why do it? Like, what was the point of it if you're not even going to commit to it? Well, and especially like I maybe see the point if you're arguing that uh, Jean Reno is just smarter. I guess which he is. I get well, but did we need to prove that? <laughs> no one was questioning who's smarter, Jean Reno or Chris Klein. Yeah. yeah. Um. But that doesn't even come into play. But that's what I mean. It, it there was no point to that scene because it so immediately was negated that it was just a waste of time. You know, like Chris Klein, even when he sees that um, Rebecca Romain gets traded to the team that he's playing in the finals, um, he's just like, oh, OK, rollerball. Well, the thing he's mad about is that they tattooed her her number on her face. That's what upsets him. And then that they bench her. So beautiful. They bench her anyway. They don't even play her in the game. And then she just comes off the bench to try to save his life. And then puts on a red hat and like saves him. And then gets, sees the red team. And then gets handcuffed. Yeah. Um, and then Chris Klein does jumps off a ramp and drop kicks Jean Renault, killing him, I guess. I guess. Yeah. And then he for sure kills the other guy. Um, Sanjay Naveen Andrews. Yeah. Um, and then. Everybody wins. Yeah. And then I guess there's a <laughs> a people's revolution in Russia. <laughs> And they restore rollerball to its competitive roots. None of this worked fixed nonsense. No, but there's definitely implied that like the mining towns are revolting against the government (laughs) at the end because because of Chris Klein, because Chris Klein and rollerball that they're all going to like take to the streets and like, like storm St. Petersburg (laughs) at the end. Yeah. Why not? Um, Not since Rocky Balboa. Ah, uh, has an American come to Russia and really shaken shit up so much? Yeah, right. Um, I don't know. I think before we pivot, I think it's important to mention that apparently the script to this movie was one of the best scripts that many people had read. And McTiernan was just like, nah, not going to do that. <laughs> like, that's all the trivia I've read is that he's like, no, nah, we're just going to rollerball. That's what people want. They don't want the social commentary. They don't want the, uh, you know, intelligence. They just want the rollerball. They want new metal and they want Chris Klein. They, they want Chris Klein, Slipknot, Rob Zombie, rollerball. Yeah. And he was clearly right. Yeah. That's what that's why it's the greatest movie of all time. <laughs> that's why we're changing our format this week and doing awesome movies that are unimpeachable. That have. Uh, rocketed already big stars to the stratosphere of movie stardom right exactly (laughs) no this like this is the 2002-est movie i think i've ever seen it definitely yeah it for sure is like it the soundtrack is what every guy like i didn't really like was listening to in 2002 yeah the soundtrack, like, definitely is wearing a puka shell ne- necklace and, like, wearing a tapped out T-shirt. Oh, definitely has a tap out T-shirt on. Yeah. Um, 
probably has frosted tips. Yeah. Um, definitely takes a lot of creatine. Yep. Yeah. Um, will fight you. Will fight you. Yeah. Uh, definitely has Oakley's on backwards. <laughs> and probably one of those, uh, what are the, the visors visors? Yeah. Just a visor like with upside down. Yeah, of course. Gotta have that. Yeah. Um, Yep, pretty much. Nipples pierced. Tri- uh, either barbed wire around one arm or just a big tribal on the shoulder. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe both. <laughs> no. It was just Randy Orton. That's who we're describing. <laughs> if Randy Orton was a soundtrack. It would be, it would be Rollerball. It would be Rollerball. <laughs> um, yeah, this, this movie, it, it's such a delightful time capsule and i mean that in the least complimentary way possible it's such a reminder of the progress we've made since 2002 (laughs) you say progress i say distance well either way yeah yeah yeah. we've gotten away from it that whether it's in the right direction or not you know that's in the eye of the beholder but but it's firmly not doing that anymore but it's firmly in the rear view Yes, we are away from it. It's not. It can't thing. hurt us anymore. <laughs> New metal is safely away um, on some XM channel that nobody listens to. Somebody, and that's it. Somebody listens to. Somebody, a lot, a lot of people probably listen to. Yeah, but we don't have to know about it. That's what's great. Yeah. Um. I know. I'm ready to pivot. Yeah, Paul Heyman. Paul Heyman. <laughs> Uh, or or let's do it paul Heyman. my name is paul Heyman. and let's actually full respect wwe hall of famer paul Heyman. paul Heyman. yeah he is so good in this movie legitimately no he really is like he he understood exactly what was being asked of him he builds a. He's not in it that much when you really think about it, but he managed to build a character in the way that he reads the lines and the way that he reacts to getting information. Paul, yeah, he's legit just the commentator. Yeah, no, but you get a sense watching it that it's like this guy. He's bought in, but clearly he's frustrated that the these Amer- this American team's getting screwed over. That like they're making these changes. You know, he he seems to care about the integrity of rollerball. He wants to sell you on it. And but also he believes in the sport as an entertainment venue. But also he's not gonna rock the boat. You know, he's no. not gonna he's not standing up to anyone. That that's just another thing that makes absolutely no sense. So at some point it's revealed that uh Jean Renault's character, Alexei Petrovich, uh is close to getting an American TV deal. Yeah. And on theoretically in the rollerball match that is going to secure this deal, he decides let's murder Chris Klein because <laughs> that's what North American TV audience is like live murder. Mm-hmm. Yeah, makes total sense. Yeah, I didn't understand that at all of like, why not just murder Chris Klein when you murdered LL Cool J? There didn't seem to be a reason not to. There was no reason to bring him. It back. was only for the movie. Right. Yeah, because it like. It would benefit you to just make up a story of why these two guys just got killed. Yeah, like it could have been an accident, like they're wild partiers, like anything could have happened. Right. Uh, But yeah, anyway, we pivoted. So Paul Heyman. Paul Heyman is so, oh my God. So good. Yeah, can we just, can we talk about Paul Heyman for a minute? Like just. He's. Paul He's the best thing about professional wrestling. He is. And he, I, I think, has gotten a fair amount of credit, but I still think you could argue not enough credit for everything that he has done for pro wrestling. That he essentially created the Attitude Era <laughs> before Vince McMahon. He, he beat Vince McMahon to that by a number of years. Um, you know, ran ECW, obviously had the financial problems, but then... The way that he has continued to reinvent himself and to make stars 
you know, like we we just saw Roman Reigns title, you know, like epic 1300 plus day title reign come to an end at WrestleMania 40. And Roman Reigns has a lot of strengths, but being great on the mic is not one of them. And, and I, he's gotten way better from suffering succotash. And I think he's gotten way better because he's hanging out with Paul Heyman. And I think Paul Heyman makes you better. Uh, like, I think he's always a guy that's understood people's strengths and weaknesses and, and knows how to promote guys and is my favorite person to be at ringside reacting to things happening. Yeah, the, like, the look on his face when Undertaker's streak ended is unbelievable. Yeah. Um, cause he knew it was happening. Yeah, of course he did. Like, you know, but like he sells the surprise so well. Um, no, just it with a very short list of exceptions, every major star in the last 30 years of professional wrestling has direct ties to Paul Heyman. Right. Yeah. And all the guys that went on to be huge stars in the WWE, like Paul Heyman was the guy who took someone like Steve Austin, who was a Hollywood blonde and was like, you know what? He, this guy's good at yelling at people and being an asshole and also i don't know stand next to sandman and watch everything he does and then maybe do that when you get to the wwe maybe do that with the ability to actually talk yeah <laughs> uh but uh you, like, know, you know how sandman drinks beer do that but like with good wrestling <laughs> yeah what if there was the drinking beer part but also more <laughs> what if it wasn't just a five minute entrance <laughs> entrance and then beating a guy with a cane yeah um but but literally like mick foley brock lesnar cm punk um roman reigns like some of the biggest names of the last however long but all, like eddie guerrero ray mysterio eddie, like all, anybody that came through ecw's yeah. doors obviously yeah but you know um he was in charge of OVW when they were putting out their top talent, like all right. of it. No, and I, I do actually believe that he is the smartest person in pro wrestling, that he has the greatest pro wrestling mind and is just infinitely creative and has limitless potential. And I don't know, this is not what this podcast is about, but if I was, say, Tony Khan and I had a lot of money, I would be throwing as much of it as possible at getting Paul Heyman to AEW. Yeah, um, because Tony Khan does need help booking. And that would, like, it would be number one on my list, would be Paul Heyman. Like, of anyone, if you told me, if I was Tony Khan and you told me I could have any person on the WWE, that would be where I'd start. Because mm -hmm. he has so much talent. And you, like, what's missing is a, someone like Paul Heyman to go this is what works this is what doesn't this is what you could do better this is the card top to bottom instead of we'll, we'll focus on one thing and make it really good and then kind of half-ass everything else which like one of my favorite stories that i think encapsulates paul Heyman is I, i've heard him talk about mikey whipwreck who was an ecw guy who he said was just this like really clean cut likable kid that wanted to be a wrestler really badly and would just help set up the ring you know, he'd show up at ECW and he would just help put the ring together just for the chance to get to get into the ring before the show and, you know, get to do some moves and learn some stuff. And he realized just how likable this guy looked and like how young and innocent he looked. And he, so he was like, OK, I'm going to make you a wrestler. But here's the deal. You will never hit an offensive move. You will just get beat up. And then if you win, it'll be a fluke. <laughs> And that worked. That was a and brilliant he, strategy. He won the ECW championship that way. <laughs> yeah. Like, just never. And nobody questioned it. No, because it was like, that's what worked about him. Like, yeah, if you were good on the mic and not a great wrestler, he'd work with that. If you were a great wrestler and not good on the mic, he'd work with that. Like, whatever your strengths and weaknesses were, he could play to the strengths and hide the weaknesses. Yeah, no, he's great. Um I'm not surprised that he didn't have much of a movie career because there's only so much he could do in the movies. It's yeah. basically this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what what is he going to do? Yeah, I, I agree with that. But I, I think I would have watched him do this in 10 more movies. Yeah. <laughs> and, and like, 
I think the Harry Potter movies would have been that much better if he was calling the Quidditch matches. Why doesn't Quidditch have an announcer? I don't know. As God is my witness, he's gotten the snitch. By God, Harry my Potter's God, done it. Snitch. Harry Potter's done it. That son of a bitch. <laughs> Through hellfire and brimstone. Harry Potter's <laughs> called the snitch. <laughs> I would have loved those movies so much more. Yeah. That son of a bitch Malfoy. <laughs> that Jezebel Hermione Granger. Oh man. What a what a what a missed opportunity. What a missed opportunity, yeah. Yeah. What were you it's thinking, swift. Chris Columbus? Yeah, David Yates. Come on, man. <laughs> Um, Jean Renault. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Like, I love that there, this char character was completely one-dimensional. There was no attempt to make him uh, anything more than just capitalism. Yeah, unfettered evil capitalism. It really worked for me, yeah. Uh, and he was just so smarmy in a way that Jean Renault usually isn't smarmy, which was great. Yeah, he's usually more charming than this. Um, but yeah, like, but still menacing. Mm -hmm. Even though he never lifted a finger to actually harm somebody. Nope. He was, which a lot of times he is the heavy, like he is the tough guy. Yeah, he but, definitely can be. Yeah. Um, but no, he was so good as the villain in this, and um, I like what what a great that guy Jean Renault is. You know, like he's does one thing, but he does it. You know, he's not doesn't at least doesn't show the range. He might have it. But like when people cast Jean Renault, it's for a very specific type of actor. Yeah. And he's great at it and I love it. And he's incredibly charismatic and, you know, like committed and believable. And it's he's great. I do love him in Mission Impossible when the movie toyed with the idea of like, if he was bad or not, but he never played it like he wasn't. Oh, that was a really fascinating choice of like, oh, is this guy the evil one? The guy who's been evil the whole time? Oh, huh. The evil guy's <laughs> evil. What do you know? <laughs> never would have seen that coming. Yeah. Yeah. God bless him. Uh, but no, he's, um, he's fantastic. Yeah, no, he's great. Uh, I love LL Cool J. I mean, he's ridiculous. You but know, you know who else loves him? Ladies, ladies, yeah. the ladies love him. Mm -hmm. No, he's you know, great. He was a, he was originally going to be AL Cool J, and he loves Cool James. But he's like, you know what? I need to appeal to a wider swath of this, of society. <laughs> I think he should be A A L L Cool J. Uh, Andy and ladies love Cool J. I mean, I pitched it to him. Yeah, but he hasn't replied to any of my emails. <laughs> I think he did. Didn't he reply once to say, stop emailing this to me? No, um, I just got a reply from someone called Mailer Demon. Oh, OK. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think he just closed that email address. Mailer Demon, who is one of Paul Heyman's failed uh, ECW characters. He didn't quite take off, but, you know, I appreciated the effort. Yeah. Um, Mailer Demon. <laughs> That sounds a lot more like Vince McMahon in 1994 than anything ECW was doing. If if Vince McMahon un understood email enough to have done it, he would have. That's like a secondary gimmick for Kane after like he started to wane a little bit. She said, it's the mailer demon. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's it, right? There's we don't that we did it. <laughs> I mean, I think no, like Paul Heyman's great. Um, the movie's ridiculous. It's a it's a time capsule for 2002. It's probably for, I mean, look, McTiernan is a good action director. This is not his best work, but there's still stuff that's fun to watch because he's good at doing action sequences. <laughs> yeah, the rollerball scenes are exciting. Yeah, you know, it's um, you probably saw this on TBS in 2007. Yeah. So, you know, remember that time and don't watch it again. You don't you don't need to.
Rollerball. Silver Linings Playback is a production of Hobotrashcan.com. If you enjoyed the show, please rate or review it on Apple Podcasts. Hear more great shows on the Peak Sloth Podcast Network.